Hello and welcome everyone to episode 16, season two of Digitales. My name is Fazan Sayed, founder and CEO of East River. And today I have someone from Wisconsin. He is a culture czar, a business coach, and has someone who has worked in more than 50 countries. He's been an entrepreneur for a long time and he helps businesses accelerate within the entrepreneur's organization. He is the president of EO Wisconsin. He's also an EO Accelerator trainer, and he's definitely someone who can help you build your company's culture correctly, perfectly, and drive it to accelerated growth. His name is Will Scott, and he's here today. Thank you, Will. How are you today? Fantastic. Hello, Fazan. Thank you for having me on the show. Well, I loved your chat in, in one of these EO sessions we had, Jumpstart January. And I, I flipped through your book as well. And you talk about culture um, as a gift, which is very different from how other people talk about company culture. Tell me, why do you refer to it as a gift? Yes, I, I definitely want those words to be increasingly used uh, in recognition that culture really is a gift. So first of all, it's certainly a gift to the employee or associate, you know, that is in that company or other organization. If it's a great culture, that's a real gift to be spending, you know, eight give or take hours a day in that environment. Mm -hmm. So many people are in cultures, aren't they, Fazan, which are not, you know, great cultures. So it's a gift for them. It's also a gift for the business owner or the organization leader, because of mm -hmm. course this, these, these principles apply to religious organizations, government organizations, but it's a gift to the leader to have a great culture where people are, love working together. They have a mission that excites them, a purpose. Mm -hmm. And they also, you know, are feeling you know, safe and fulfilled in that environment. And I could go on, but there's so many ways. It's, it's actually, let me give you one more gift of culture, mm -hmm. which is it's a really low investment. It's a low cost for a leader to invest in culture. But the reward is so high that the return on culture, the return on that investment is massive. So, so many ways that I like to think that culture really is a gift and it's one that we should therefore handle with care and nurture, you know? It's interesting you say that because a lot of leaders or a lot of, let's say, employees or team members in any organization feel that culture is actually the hardest thing to build, you know? And it's, it's interesting you say it's an easy thing to do and the return on investment is high. Why do you think it's easy to build culture? I mean, I well, would say it's one of the hardest things to do in any organization, especially one that is a, sort of pursuing rapid growth. Yes. No, I don't say it's easy. I say the investment is low, meaning mm. the, the financial investment. Got right? it. It doesn't okay. take, it's not like going into the risk, like launching a new product or going to a new market that's risky and takes a lot of investment. Investing in your culture and just caring about people is a low financial investment. But no, I agree with you, Fazan, it is not easy, which is really why I wrote the book, The Culture Fix. And we call it the easiest fix for the hardest thing in business. Because what I feel is missing is a simple step-by-step -step guide. How do I go about leading my team to have a great culture? And I think there's... Um, we overemphasize the value of simply having core values. People come up with core values, mm -hmm. throw them on the wall and think their job is done. Mm -hmm. I believe there's a very big difference between having core values and having a valued culture. So um, that's why we came up with the nine deeds in 90 days. We were talking earlier, Fazan, about measuring culture, weren't we? Mm -hmm. And um, how important it is to do an ENPS score, for example. Correct. And... You, we can see with these 90s and 90 days, we can see a dramatic improvement in what um, folks will say in just four months. So I guess my team member is taking a quick picture. Is that all right to do that in your podcast? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Turn and look at me. So. There Meet we go. Yeah. Hold on. One more time. One more time. Okay. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Please, you're in the nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you, too. All the, way from, all the way from Pakistan. All the so way from Pakistan. Cool. I love how yes. Zoom connects us all over the world. Zoom place. just brings awesome. and bridges everything. There's there's no world it anymore. It's all it's all real time. Oh, it's so cool. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Sorry, nice you. to meet you. Nice to meet you. 
And so, look, and Will, that's one thing that's interesting to me. You talk about 90 days. I mean, in 90 days, you're saying that you can actually create change in culture and drive it towards, a, let's say, the positive momentum and the positive sort of frame of mind that you need in your team yes. members. How do you do that? Give me some steps. I mean, I'd love to yes. try this out of my company. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No, so exactly. So we are, the question is, you know, what score would you give your company for having a great culture? Okay. On a scale of one to 10. And yes, I'm, I'm, I've seen, you know, with a lot of my clients, I've seen scores, in, you know, early on, let's say 50 and below on the MPS score. But after just four months, we can absolutely see scores 80s and 90s. So wow. how do we do that? Well, the point is, we're not just working with leadership. You see, most culture coaches will say, work with the leadership, discern the values, figure out the strategy, and then go tell everybody else to kind of get on board. Right. I teach the opposite. I teach we should be working with everybody in the company. So we do surveys, we do interviews, and we really get to understand the DNA of the entire company. And from the majority of the population, not just the few folks at the top who can often have a different impression of the company. Mm -hmm. And then as we go through the other nine steps over this sort of, um, you know, uh, 12 week period, then um, we're taking everybody along with us and we're testing, hey, what do you think of this? And then we're asking everybody to get involved. Once we've got the words perfected, which is the alive phase. So I like to mm -hmm. say that we want to bring our cultures alive, make them thrive, and then use them to drive performance. So we bring them alive by really carefully wordsmithing and curating the words based on what we have learned from our research within the company. Mm -hmm. And then we like to bring bring graphical representation to them you've seen some of our work in the book mm -hmm. and because when we combine images with carefully crafted words we do this Fazan. we augment our communal intelligence and we increase our human bandwidth isn't that lovely think of infographics think of the power of that communication method for augmenting our communal intelligence which is which is culture so, um, and then there's some other things that we go through, like um, being able to, to, to rank team members according to their alignment with culture based on certain behaviors and giving them feedback, like hiring folks that are um, in alignment with our values. Interesting. And that doesn't mean everybody has to be the same, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they just have to buy into the values. Um, and then also on hiring people and the other things that we that we talk about um, in, in, in the book. Yes, it's interesting. I mean, you talk about, first of all, setting your values that you want in individuals and your company to demonstrate. And you talk about recruiting based on those values. Right. So if a value is being creative, if a value is honesty, integrity. I mean, these are all very cliched and every pretty much every company uses pretty much the same values. But you're saying yeah. that. To drive that in the organization, you should interview people to give examples of those values to actually discern whether they carry them in their everyday life or not? Yes. So I have a couple of parts to your question. The first part is, yes, I do encourage companies to actually have values that um, are not simply integrity, honesty, trust. Now, many do, and there mm -hmm. are very good reasons for those, and hopefully they augment that value with a really good descriptive behavior that says what we mean by trust or integrity in our company. But I do think it's more fun and engaging for, for the population of that organization if we can have different ways of saying those words, different um, ways of saying, talking about you know integrity and trust. Um, and I do love it when you can come up with a two word value or, or multiple words for a value uh, because it's just can be more descriptive and more more different and more more unique. Mm -hmm. So 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 that's that. But yes, how do we screen when we're interviewing? How do we screen for folks that represent that value? Right. Well, here's one here's one beautiful way to do that. And there are, I think, you know, several ways to answer this. But let's just focus on one that we talk about in the culture fix, and that is, hopefully, we've been gathering stories of when real employees in our company committed that value or or demonstrated that behavior and then we make those stories part of our folklore and part of our screening or interviewing situation and we present that as a behavioral question to the candidate as a situation and ask them what they would do 
And the key here in terms of the skill of using this technique is not just to take the first thing that they say, but to dig a little bit, go two and three layers down on their response to that. And what we're looking for is, do they genuinely seem to demonstrate this behavior in a natural way as our employees that are aligned do? And in, we've always got one correct answer, which is what actually happened in our company from that story of that employee using that value. Got it. So you're saying you take that story that has happened within the company, share that into the interviewee to set that as an example. And then when they're giving the answer, dig a little bit deeper, force them to think through it, to see whether they really naturally demonstrate it or it's more sort of fictional. Yes, to say the least. absolutely. Now, if you're screening 10 candidates using that same approach, and I like to have a spreadsheet and see all the different on and note the answers as they're saying them. Um, and then you can definitely see, you know, which ones are a more genuine response, can't you? And so you focus on those two or three candidates out of the 10 and, and then go deeper on that. And I like to see a team doing this, maybe even multiple teams, like two or three groups of two doing the interviews, one asking, one observing, and then they collaborate on that and then use the core score that we promote in the book to, to give a, um, a, a score, basically, to that candidate's um, likelihood of aligning with our value. And if you do this methodically, do the interviews, note them, different people in the company score them on, on a sheet, there's going to be a candidate who bubbles to the top and is going to give you a, no guarantees, but going to be a much more likely to align with your culture and your team's going to love onboarding that new candidate. Interesting. And so now tell me, now you've onboarded the candidate. They've worked really hard. We've set some goals and targets in terms of, you know, sort of at the end of the day, it's a commercial enterprise. Profitability is a target. Maybe it's an NPS yes. score of your clients. That's a target. And then end of the year comes around. The individual has not met the targets, but they've demonstrated all the values. So when you do a performance review at the end of the year, do you just do a performance review of the commercial targets or do you do a performance review of the commercial targets and the core values? And what if they were behind on the commercial targets, but they really knocked it out of the park on the core values? How does that play out? Yeah. Okay. So phase two of that core score tool that I mentioned, the first one is we have a spreadsheet and we assign um, a number to that candidate or that employee. Well, let's talk about employees now, really, because we're doing those reviews at the end of the year. But that that employee, um, in terms of what, what number do they have for demonstrating that behavior? And the way I like to phrase that, Fazan, is, is, um, is three would be they do that, demonstrate that value all of the time. Two is most of the time. One is some of the time and zero is none of the time. So that's mm -hmm. the scoring, and you can really do that, assign those very quickly across four values to four different people, and a score will emerge, which hopefully is not simply gut feel, but got a bit more, a bit more testing to it. Um, so phase two of that is putting to folks now, now we've got their value score, I like to put them in a matrix. And okay. on one scale is cultural alignment, and on the other scale is performance. And your question is, what if someone has a high cultural alignment but low performance? Right. Well, typically, of course, then it's likely that person actually is a great fit for your company and a great team member, but they're, they're not in the right role. And so we need okay. to find a role in the company where they can perform. So, and we've seen this all the time, haven't we? So somebody's kind of hired into you know, a sales role mm -hmm. and then it turns out actually that they're not great at selling but maybe they're really good at account management and supporting existing clients, or they're really good at some technical aspect of our offering. And so we move them into that role, they feel better, their performance goes up, and we have retained now a, somebody that's a great cultural alignment, uh, alignment, and we're helping them perform in the role as well. Everybody wins. Interesting. So you're saying that this can end up being an indicator of individuals who may be placed incorrectly. And we should yes. look at it potentially as a, a gauge for that. Yes. You know, why aren't they performing? We usually perform in areas in, in doing things that we like doing. 
Correct. And then we might like to be good at them. And so I believe if you've got somebody that is scoring high on culture and is scoring low on performance, then yes, there's usually some something there around the role that they're in. Um, and now, now, of course... And, and, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, if they're, if they're scoring low on performance and culture, I find that if they're scoring really low, you can't train them into being better culture if if they're if, if they're close and just just you know missing the mark and they're let's say yellow not red if on a green yellow red scale then we can perhaps just give them feedback around their behaviors train them tell them our stories show them what good looks like here hopefully they're hearing every week at the town hall about mm -hmm. stories when someone is performing well against the values um so so but if they're falling low on culture and performance then I think the best thing is to unhire that person. Best for them in the long run, and your team is going to breathe a sigh of relief because what they even though they didn't like the low performance, they for sure didn't like the low culture fit. <laughs> right, that's true. But yeah. I think the biggest challenge lies in organizations when you have someone who is a high performer but has the low cultural fit. Because yeah. they're delivering, they're exceeding targets, they're, they're out there, they're bringing in the business. I mean, they're fantastic yeah. commercially. Yeah. But they just bring with them that culture of very hardcore driven, I need to get this done, get out of my way. I am the guy or I am the girl who's delivering. Please, I don't need you. You know, and so they bring that culture of sort of, yeah. it's about me and what I bring to the table. I don't need to worry about you. How do you deal with those? Because they really can end up being very toxic, even though they are profitable to the company. Right. Well, you know, I actually, I actually would like to challenge, you know, th th that assumption that someone is high performing and low culture. Because actually, I think if they're high performing and low culture, they're causing disruption within the company. And therefore, yes, they might be able to sell and bring in orders, but that good is outweighing the damage that's been done internally with their disruption. I bet, you know, in my experience, then they're, they're not selling stuff that's easy for our team to deliver. They're not mm. selling stuff that's core to our business. And this is often this, this situation often, and you even, it came through in your question that it's typically a sales kind of person right. has often got this label. Mm -hmm. um, and, and look in the long term. The best thing for that company to do is to unhire that poor culture fit and get somebody who is not just high performing, but also a great culture fit. And then then the way the work flows through the company is just going to be a lot less disruptive. We're going to make more money. We're going to have um, we're going to have a more harmonious you know, workforce. And it's just in the long run, everybody tends to agree, don't they? That um, that those folks are not actually high performing in the big picture, and and it's not worth trying to make that work. Interesting. And so let's say now you've gotten the culture right. You know, you've gotten the right people on. You've coached them. Um, they're fitting on the cultural values. They're making progress. Can the company culture? dictate the kind of customers or clients the company goes after i mean can is is that a situation that you've seen yeah I, I, absolutely so by the way that that is and look I, I, perhaps some of our listeners are also members of the entrepreneurs organization or eo like like you and i uh but yes th that's the nirvana for us when we have and i talk about managing our, our team you know up the culture access and along the performance access, because when everyone's in that magic top right quadrant, mm -hmm. performing and aligned, so that everyone likes w working together, they like where they work, they have a purpose for their work, and all those good things are happening. That's when, as EOs, we can work more on the business, less in the business. We can go to those universities halfway across the world for right. ten days, <laughs> and everything <laughs> is good. We know the company's in good hands, and everything has been has been led. So it's really a great place to be. And yes, absolutely. I think too often we think leading culture is leading within the four walls of the company. But leading culture is much more grandiose than that, isn't it, Fazan? It's about going beyond to, to, to our customers and to our vendors and to our yeah. associations that we're members of and, and everything else. And uh, when we are aligned with customers and vendors who are aligned with our values, 
business is a lot smoother, a lot less friction, and we make more money in those transactions. So I do like when we are considering taking on board another customer, especially in a B2B business space where maybe every customer, you know, we have a small number of larger customers, mm -hmm. then, then taking on that customer that we do consider. And in that sales, in that kind of sales conversation, we are saying to them, these are the kinds of companies that we work well with. These are our values. And, and really put that out there before we even get engaged with that customer. Same thing with vendors. You know, hey, Mr. Vendor, please note our values. And more important, all the contracts we're signing, if we don't see these values demonstrated, we're going to be having that conversation with you because we know how important and how valuable it is when we are aligned on values. And um, I do this all the time in workshops is help just, hey, do the same thing for an employee that we do for a customer. Give them a score against your core values and um, we'll quickly see which customers are in the red at the bottom. And they have they usually are scoring very low on values fit. They're also this happens every time, person, every time. Also, they're really hard to work with and we don't make any money with them. So people. Let's unhire that customer. It changes the world for everybody. It changes the world for the, your team. The people that are delivering the work will be so relieved and can give energy to it. And you know what? Measuring them on culture is such an easy thing to do, but we don't, we don't do enough of it. But if, if, that, if, if that customer name is coming up all the time in the management meetings, just like that, that troublesome employee name is coming up all the time, think, do a quick values fit, and hiring them changes changes the world. You, what you're saying is challenging my thought process. I mean, I'm just immersed in what you're saying because you're actually saying unhire your clients because they don't fit your culture. Yes, yes. I mean, oh, that, but, but you're gift. giving, that, but you're giving up gift, a revenue stream. <laughs> you're giving up a revenue stream. How do you give up a revenue stream that is so difficult? Well, I mean, I understand the team gets frustrated yes. and you know the client might not be the best client. But a revenue stream yeah. is still a revenue stream, right? Well, you're giving up a revenue stream, but you're, I bet you're not giving up a profitability stream. And, you know, um, what does Vern Harnish say? You know, revenue is 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 insanity or something. Revenue, <laughs> profit is revenue, sanity. Sanity, profit is sanity. Profit is sanity. Profit is sanity. Cash is king. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, y yes, you might lose some revenue, but, oh, my goodness, your profitability will likely go up. And that's more important. And that's just breathing space for everybody on the team now to do fewer customers, fewer projects, more profitably, and less, you know, on the hamster wheel of having to, to, to stress and deliver those more things when it's not even profitable. Um, so, I, but I do believe that is a general truth that if the customer is a low value fit mm -hmm. with your culture, they are also going to be a lot of friction therefore high costs of transaction mm. and low profitability. And it's a very low risk to unhire that, that, that customer. Very and you were saying, risk. to your point earlier, you said that this is something that you should potentially have a discussion up front. Is this something you've seen people put in their contracts and say, hey, listen, you know, because yes. contracts have all the points. You just say, these are well, my values. We will evaluate yes. you on these twice a year. <laughs> and if you don't fit, bye-bye. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, certainly in the proposal. I don't know if I've seen it in a contract, but certainly in the proposal, yes. Right. And, and why not put it in the contract? I actually think it's far more important and valuable than when the relationship goes bad and I have to reach for the contract. That's bad. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. That might mean lawyers. That might mean, you know, pay, lots of pain. But if I reach instead for my values and have a values conversation with that vendor or customer, where there's a lot of stress, oh my goodness, that can really change change things. And it's a really respectful way to do it, which is why when I talk coach business leaders about unhiring an employee, use the values, sit the same side of the table as that employee and use the values and simply go through, listen, here we're all about teamwork. We've noticed that you're a bit of a lone cowboy. You like to crank code on your own and mm -hmm. then deliver us the result afterwards. Hey, there's a real place. There's a skill for that. There's a place for that. It's just we value teamwork and we like to share and, and, and co-create code as we go along. So and you go through all four or five values and pretty soon that 
employee say, oh, yeah, perhaps you're right. This is not the ideal place for me. And it's a really respectful, unhiring conversation. And I like to use the word unhire because we likely hired that person. And if we say you're fired in that ugly kind of, mm -hmm. um, you know, one way sort of a, a conversation, I think that's not only bad for that individual it's and bad for, for me, the leader, it's also mm -hmm. bad for everybody else in the company. It's bad for culture to fire people, but right. to unhire people around values is actually just, you know, humans being humane. And, 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 and when I say on hire, I think I'm accepting some of the responsibility for this not working out. It's an uncoupling. It's not me saying you did, you messed up. It's saying we messed up and let's just, you know, go our way. So, um, and you can do the same thing with customers and vendors. And it's amazing to have a conversation around values rather than, you know, more contentious things. This is very fascinating because you're basically making all conversations around, let's say, improvement, performance improvement, centered on the core values of the company. And so it's no longer about an individual. It's about the value that needs to be demonstrated by the individual. Exactly. And um, so I like to tell the story about when I was growing up in Zambia and I used to love, love building tree houses and clubhouses. Mm -hmm. I even had a mango, uh, sorry, uh, a bamboo hut underneath a mango tree. And in all of these cases, and I would build these places, you know, on my own lovingly because I love doing it. But before I invited people to come and share the space with me, I would nail some rules to the side of the clubhouse. Okay. And I think this is, and when I realize now I'm going and helping companies put core values on the walls, it's a bit like rules in a clubhouse. And here's, here's why I'm telling this story in response to your question is because one of my rules is always be nice to each other. And as soon as my friends were not being nice to each other, I could put a lid on that very quickly simply by saying, hey, we all agreed to be nice to each other and point to the rules of the clubhouse that we'd all agreed to. And now I'm not being an asshole, I'm not being bossy, I'm simply calling on our agreement as friends and colleagues to adhere to certain values. Why? Because it makes it safe for us, it protects us. And so um, I don't think we do enough of that. And that's why I don't believe core values on the wall are just a poster. They are a real tool for our employees to say, hey, we all agreed and point to something that's outside of you and me, right? Which might be an argument and it's just something we've all agreed to. And I just think it's, it's a beautiful way to, to make a, a, a culture and environment safe between folks. D does this make sense to you? What it's, do you think? It's, it's blowing my mind. I mean, I'm processing it as I'm listening to it because what you're saying is you've set the rule up. You're saying these are the rules of engagement. And if you are to enter, let's say, the treehouse or this relationship, yeah. you are signing off on the rules of engagement. And anytime yeah. you deviate from the rules of engagement, you either have to sort of follow the rules and sort of correct yeah. action or yeah. there's the door. Yeah. Um, but I'm careful not to use the word rules today, right? I'm sort of signing that with my kind of treehouse analogy. But I actually like I like I like the we kind of a phrase better. And it's one of right. the beautiful words to put in core values is we believe, you know, we something because it's right. really like a um, so I prefer that language. Hey, you know, we're really interested in putting you making you part of our team. But this is how we define our culture. And from everything we've seen, you look like these would be values that you would resonate with. But once you're a part of the team, we're definitely going to be holding you accountable to these values. And we will be measuring you and looking at, at, at you on that. And also we give you permission to hold us accountable to those values. If ever you see me doing something which doesn't show respect, if that's one of our values, respect for you, and you don't feel like I'm listening to you, then mm -hmm. please call me, challenge me on that. And um, that's the sort of way I like to have that conversation about, about it. Yes, if, if that difference is coming through interesting but how would this be enforced in a post-covid hybrid work world where 
people are sort of in a mixed environment, at least for the near term, it might change and revert back to the old ways. But in the near term, and we've seen this for now almost two years, um, you know, how has this changed? What have you seen? And how have you maintained, how helped companies maintain culture during this challenging time? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd like to, to, to begin by saying that I don't think, you know, what we are called upon as leaders of great organizations where there is, you know, a, a high degree of, 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 of performance and teamwork is certain things have to come through, right? Mm -hmm. Whether, and, and my point is about saying this is some things haven't changed pre COVID, during COVID, post COVID. I think the best leaders are still caring about their culture are leading with a values based leadership style. Right. And some of the big values that are coming through there are caring and kindness and those kinds of values. I think that mattered before, during and after COVID. But I think your question is also alluding to the fact that what about the fact that we're now remote and we're not physically together and we're not coming into an office and some of those things. And so, exactly. yes, there are definitely some tactics that we can take to help maintain a culture um, and I agree, it is harder in a, in a disparate, um, and if we've got multiple people in multiple time zones, in multiple countries with different backgrounds and coexisting on Zoom or working remote and, and but trying to adhere to one set of values, you know, th there are some little things I like to, to, to recommend there. Things like um, checking in one on one. It's not always a team thing. If I, if I, as long as you've got a manageable number of employees, it's really important, I think, that, that we check in one on one. And we're not just asking about, hey, how's the work going? It's, hey, how are you doing personally? How are things at home? And, and maybe they would volunteer some things like, gosh, I just wish I could stop work at four o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays to go to my kids' soccer practice, you know. Mm -hmm. But I feel if I'm not online, people are going to see that. Oh my goodness, what a gift. If I can say, okay, I understand that's a specific need for you. I would like you to have that. And we're going to make everybody aware of it. Start an hour earlier on those days, whatever the solution is. But rather than that person wrestling with that guilt and all that. Um, so checking in one-on-one, -on -one, really showing you care. You're trying to accommodate their individual circumstances. And I think employment today almost is a one-to-one -one relationship. It's not a one-to-many, hey, all follow our HR handbook. So um, that I also think if we can get everybody together once, at least once a year, fly if as long as, you know, the costs are affordable and all that, can we get everybody together? And when we do that for like a retreat or training or something, don't over schedule the entire two to three days. Give folks some time just to hang out and get to know each other. And when they go back to their bases, culture has changed. They do feel more connected more loyal, more fulfilled. So I could go on on this particular question, but I'm going to stop there. No, no, that's, <laughs> but, a, good, uh, that's a good point. Yeah. And retreats typically, and your point around retreats and bringing people together, especially in the COVID times, I think that's a very valuable point. Yes. And is there, in your view, a number of retreats at a minimum that you should do where you bring people together if you are able to, let's say, the means afforded, the size affords it? Is it once a year, twice a year? I mean, and how do you see... What is it about a retreat that changes the dynamic the very next day? Yeah. Um, well, you know, look, I know what it's like. I, I've run, I, I've had my own businesses too, and I know what it's like to, to sort of swallow a, a really big expense. Um, but if the profitability is there, I definitely think the value is there in doing it. I'm going to say at least once a year for everybody. And then perhaps, you know, we've learned, haven't we, in our planning process, that there's, not, there's something very magical for the human brain about 90 days and maybe the human heart mm -hmm. as well about this 90 day period so if we can get teams together not necessarily the whole company but teams together quarterly with their mm -hmm. leader to set reset their strategy and to tell those have those shout outs about core values and things that can be super valuable so maybe it's once a year for the whole company and at least quarterly for teams if you can do it Interesting. And now has this, uh, has this approach, has this structure um, changed or is it different as we are seeing more of the Gen Z 
enter the workplace. I mean, they've got a completely different uh, way of thinking, ethos, yes. everything. I mean, they're just they're just a different generation, yeah. right? How yes, do you see right. this playing now, out for them? Well, two words: embrace culture. <laughs> you know, mm, okay. Because yes, the things that we're talking about in culture today, where people are needing flexibility. There, people are needing um, to feel valued. People need feedback. People right. need to believe they're working for a purpose that is bigger than themselves or bigger than the dollars that the company earns. It's about the goodness that they're doing for the world, which is something that we also talk about in the Culture Fix uh, book is purpose and, and, and having a why to the work. But if we can make people feel valued, cared for, give them a purpose to their work, give them feedback, then, which is really what Gen Zs want. And millennials began that to a certain degree as well. And actually, I just think all humans really want those things. It's just that Gen Zers are able to kind of demand it because they don't need your lousy job, if I can say that. You know, and mm -hmm. I don't mean you, but they don't need a lousy job. They can go find a great job, working right. remote, doing mm -hmm. something. That, so if we don't provide that for them, it's on us as leaders. We are letting them down and giving them an excuse to go find a culture that's better. But if we lead with culture and lead with our hearts instead of our heads and appeal to them as human beings, then that'll change everything. And one of my core values in my company, Pazan, is Saubona, which is this Zulu greeting, meaning I see you. And the response when a Zulu says that to another Zulu is, Yebo Saubona, mm. I see you see me, right? So I just think that's really boils down to this whole thing and currently in mm. cultures. That's, we just want to be seen, feel cared for. And then why do I go, why am I going to look at the job board or move down the road for, for, for a dollar an hour more? If right. I'm feeling here connected, valued, purpose to my role, I'm seen, I'm heard, all those kinds of things. This is just basic human decency and courtesy, which unfortunately, some, I think, at least politically, I think we're moving away from that idea of, of kindness, caring, respect, and seeing the other person actually as a human that's sharing this planet with us and not some somebody that's separate, you know? It's I'm interesting you mentioned... No, but it's interesting you're mentioning that Gen Z the youngest generation of the lot is actually forcing the older generations, the baby boomers, yeah. the millennials as they get older, to really think about what's important. Because you would think that the older you are, the wiser you get, and you would think that you understand this. Yeah. But the fact that Gen Z is actually driving this as they enter the workforce is fascinating. And I think that even explains the, the great resignation that we've seen over the last, let's yeah. say, six, eight months. Um, them giving up what they had because they know they can get a better lifestyle just sitting at home, maybe even creating TikToks. Yeah, that, well, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, that, that's right. And so, you know, the old school sort of thinking, perhaps honestly, you know, my generation, you know, might be prone to thinking this culture is soft, squishy stuff. Correct. That's and exactly And really, what it's all about r r management by objectives. You know, if they don't cut it, they're out of here. Um, yeah, that's not going to work. That's not going to mm. work. And, and by the way, I believe it's a lot less effective. If you really want to have a high-performing company, then mm -hmm. also have one where people like being there. And um, why not have the best of all worlds? Like who you're working with. Enjoy all the achievements you're, you're achieving together in the world. Um, and hold people accountable to their numeric goals and... To their to, to their cultural goals, to the values, you know. So I think these things all work, you know. When it works well together, is when is when the magic happens. But there's so in certain cases, right? So I'm, in the cases I'm thinking of are like VC funded startups. VC funded startups typically have a very fast uh, delivery cycle. They have uh, you know huge objectives. They have a certain amount of capital that they need to deploy within, let's say, months and reach this milestone that would trigger, let's say, another round, another capital raise, and then continue the company to move forward, which means 
that everyone is always under the gun to hit that number. In that environment, yeah. it's very easy to lose sight of culture because everyone it, is number focused. Yes. How do you sort of build in this, what, you, what you've talked about for, 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 you know, since we started talking, how do you institute or architect this into a VC funded startup with that yeah. sort of hard charging mindset? By the way, you're asking, you're asking some great questions, Faz, and I'm having a lot of fun on your podcast. So Thank, you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but I would, say, I would say this, that if they really want to achieve really challenging targets and achieve them quickly, still, the best way to lead people in that respect is to lead with culture and to lead with values and to lead with heart before head. Um, think of think of Navy SEAL teams, you know, or high performing teams that that, mm -hmm. that 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 you know some of the highest performing teams. Think about those. They have a creed. They have values that they are absolutely committed to. And whether it's to think of an example, no man left behind. Right. If I believe that no man's going to be left behind, and I will not be left behind, aren't I going to commit and go harder, faster, better, and do the same for my colleagues, but I need to believe it. Great example. And that, and in there, in there comes things like trust, and and feeling safe, and these are all. The, the, so again, it comes back to values and feelings, right? Caring and caring. It's, it all comes back to the same thing for me. <laughs> That's a great example. I mean, it's funny you you, you mentioned the SEAL team example. I'm just yeah. in the middle of David Goggins' book, Can't Hurt Me. And I finished the chapter on when he sort of decided to join uh, the, the SEALs and uh, went through the training process. And you read about the training process. And it is, I mean, it is punishing. It's grueling. Yeah. And you keep yeah. thinking about, okay, why would someone do this to themselves? And how do they stay motivated during such rigorous training? And you're absolutely right. It's that camaraderie. It's the bonding. It's each man looking out for the other. And you knowing that, you know what? I know I will finish this because if I don't push myself, I know my brother behind me is going to push me through the finish line. Yeah. And again, it's, it comes down to a feeling. Why do they keep doing it? It's an inner feeling that they have really that's that's the foundation of which is the feeling of they have they have with the others yeah oh and by the way in case some of your listeners are are, are, are experts on this i don't want to assume that navy seals have the value of no man left by i think that might be a marine value i was right. just telling trying to use use that as an example and right. i may have been mixing up um mixing up some of the different branches of the military and values although i was in her majesty's royal marines myself Oh wow! And okay. um, in 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 the UK many years ago, so fascinating. I have I have I have served uh, as a reservist. Yes. So I will leave the most interesting question that I think uh, as the last question, which is, you've you've seen all sorts of values, you've seen all sorts of companies in your coaching and sort of traveling the world. If a company had to pick one value, the one value that you must have in your company, what is that value? Well, I would say that needs to be the value for that particular group. So I'm sorry to answer your question with that age old. <laughs> it depends, but it really, but it really does depend. And um, it, it, you know, and that's why I like to do the work. I like to do the work of anonymous surveys with quantitative and qualitative questions in there to really learn how do people feel about our culture, and then to do some interviews and learn a bit more. And then to, to, you know, to test of these 10 values that seem to be bubbling to the top, which ones are really more important and why? And then how can we wordsmith these and test those? What do you think of these? How do these resonate with you? Does this sound like us? Because when we get all that right, then that's where the right value is going to be for that particular organization. And um, Often they're not obvious. If you simply ask a bunch of leaders on, on a front row whiteboard, you'll get mm -hmm. some values, but you may be missing some really, you know, cool truths about it that are really important. And that's why I even believe in asking customers what values they see in my team. 
Um, and I have a vendor survey as well, all to do with culture and values. But um, it's a long answer to your question, but I think it's really, that, that is the right answer. It depends on, on the group and what is, what's going to really work most for that particular uh, population. Fantastic. Well, this was amazing. I loved this discussion. It gave me so much to think about. Um, unhiring clients is something that I don't think a lot of us really think about on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, but I think it's something that we should, especially when we're in a B2B business. Uh, yes. where there's few sort of uh, clients, but there's a large volume of work that affects the mindset of the team and the culture. Thank you again for the time. This has been really amazing. And to have you from all the way from Wisconsin on this, um, I'll put a plug in for your book, Culture Czar. Uh, we, where, we, where can we find this? Well, yes, of course, I actually have two books. Um, one is the sort of textbook, do these things in this order and get this predictable result. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's unique because um, we have taken sort of leading culture and made it a step-by-step -step process that anybody can do. Um, and that's, that's, the culture fix okay and then there's the gift of culture which just came out and we began this this interview this podcast and we're talking about the gift of culture the gift mm -hmm. of culture is the fable of a coach going into a company with a troubled culture and helping them you know go th lead through to a great culture and that book is going to summarize really everything we talked about today Fantastic. so pick your choice but they're both on amazon um i'm not sure if that would work for, for your listeners in Pakistan, but um, hopefully there are ways to, 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 to get them from, from Amazon because that's the easiest place. Absolutely. Got it. Culture Fix and the Gift of Culture. Guys, check it out. Yeah. Fantastic books. And check out Will. He's got a website as well. I think if you, it's, I'll put that in the, uh, in the description below so people can just click away and reach the website. Too. Yes. And I'm happy to help. If anyone's got questions, please reach out. Um, it, you know, the best email is will at culturesars.com. And the spelling of that will be, as you say, in the in the podcast listing. And I'll, and I'll put a plug in for that. I mean, I the, the way I connected with Will is I watched his training and I, I fell in love with the training material and I showed it to my team. And at the end of the training, I literally took a, a, a photo of your details and <laughs> okay. i just i just yeah. wrote him an email and i said hey listen we're doing this podcast i'd love to have you on we've never met before and we did yeah. this and he took out the time super helpful great conversation absolutely reach out to will he will help you out with building the strongest culture in your organization that you can think of thanks again yes. will really enjoyed it's the discussion. been my pleasure thank you i, thank I you. really appreciate the invitation thank you stay tuned for the next episode everyone till then bye-bye